greetings one and all. And in Darug, the Sydney language, Warami, which means good to see you indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, I begin by acknowledging the First Nations of the country we now call Australia and their custodianship of the land over tens of thousands of years. May we listen to God's wisdom, which the original inhabitants of this continent have been cherishing through the eons. I am Doro Kostake, uh, an associate professor of theology, the Sydney College of Divinity, in which capacity I chair the Theology Research Network, TRN, uh, taking on the mantle uh, of uh, Neil Obrod, uh, as well as the EastCast Research Director. Uh, it is my pleasure to host the first TRN EastCast seminar this year on the topic Religiously Human in a Techno-Scientific World, and to introduce today's speaker, the Reverend Professor Glenn O'Brien. Glenn is a research coordinator at uh, Eva Burroughs College within the University of Divinity, as well as the chair of examiners and a member of the university's research strategy committee. He lectures in Christian thought and history, specializing in Wesleyan studies. He's a United Church minister employed by the Salvation Army as a theological educator. He is a member of various uh, professional and ecumenical bodies, including Research Fellow of the Australia, uh, Australasian Centre for Wesleyan Research and Honorary Fellow at the Manchester Wesley Research Centre. Glenn's uh, most recent book, John Wesley's Political World, was published by Routledge in 2023. Along with Arseny Ermakov from the same college, he co-edited and contributed a volume of essays entitled A Curious Machine, Wesleyan Reflections on the Post-Human Future. Uh, with and stock 2023. Glenn has published widely on Wesleyan and Methodist themes, including three volumes in the Ashgate Methodist Studies series, entries in dictionaries and encyclopedias, and many articles and book reviews in scholarly journals. And for a full uh, bio, of course, uh, you can uh, uh, look at um, uh, the flyer for, for the event, and of course, you can look up uh, Glenn to find his uh, professional profile. Uh, the response to uh, Glenn's paper will be given by Dr. Mick Pope. Mick has a PhD in meteorology from Monash University and manages the graduate meteorologist program at the Bureau of Meteorology. He also has an MPhil in Hebrew Bible from the University of Divinity. Uh, the dissertation is to be published as From Creation to Canaan, Biblical Hermeneutics for the Anthropocene. He has recently begun a PhD in systematic theology, researching the topic extinction and the God-world relationship, a relational theology of ecocide. His previous work includes All Things New, God's Plan to Renew Our World, Morning Star 2018, A Climate of Hope, Church and Mission in a Warming World, um, co-authored, uh, 2014, and Climate of Justice 2017. Now, we begin with uh, Glenn's presentation. Uh, we cannot know much, but we may love much. John Wesley's survey of the wisdom of God in the creation, 1763, as an eco-theological resource for the late Anthropocene. The paper will uh, uh, run for about 50 minutes, after which we'll listen to mixed comments for about 10 minutes. But before we do so, um, please make sure you have your microphones switched off for the duration of the presentations. You know, we've heard sounds before. Equally important, uh, if some of you do not wish to have their faces uh, appearing in the video recording uh, and the print screens of uh, photos, please keep uh, your cameras off. Glenn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Doru. And uh, just a brief apology for my presentation style. I've had a last minute IT panic here and I'm on somebody else's laptop, which means I don't have access to my paper uh, except on my iPhone. So I'm going to be reading from my iPhone, which is not the most ideal presentation style, but we'll see how we go. It's a genuine pleasure to be invited to this seminar and to present on this topic. As a person of both reason and religion, John Wesley saw evidence in the natural world of the power, wisdom, and goodness of God. 
while it would be anachronistic to consider Wesley an eco-theologian, his deep interest in the natural world and in applied science and technology was informed by a concern for the well-being of people and all creation. This presentation will investigate Wesley's survey of the wisdom of God in the creation, or a compendium of natural philosophy, published ultimately in five volumes between 1763 and 1777. And I want to consider its value for eco-theology in the late Anthropocene. Firstly, that term. It is notoriously difficult to locate precisely the period known as the Anthropocene. It may be seen as commencing as far back as the first domestication of livestock, or the onset of the Industrial Revolution, or even as recently as the first atomic bomb testing. I use the term late Anthropocene to underscore the length of the period during which human activity has had a deleterious impact on the larger biosphere, as well as to stress the lateness of the hour, as many climate scientists believe we are reaching an irreversible climate catastrophe, a brink from which it may be too late to step back. Wesley's survey was a work of popular science, first published in 1763 and designed to be enlarged as scientific knowledge grew. It began with two volumes in the 1770 edition, but by 1777 had reached five volumes. It went through three editions in North America and was in print for more than 80 years on both sides of the Atlantic. It was not unusual for clergy in the pre-Darwinian age to be amateur naturalists, seeing in the natural world an abundant display of the wisdom of God. The dissemination of such a lengthy scientific guidebook to Methodists and especially preachers was part of Wesley's continuing educational program for his army of lay preachers, or helpers as they were called. They were expected to read the scriptures, of course, but also to develop their theology and their preaching informed by scientific knowledge of the world, as well as reading such classical theological texts as are found in Wesley's 30-volume Christian Library first published in 1750. The survey is by no means an original work. Wesley acts primarily as an editor and compiler of the work of others. Nonetheless, it does give us insight into the things that mattered to him and what he expected Methodists, and in particular his preachers, to read and to think about. The work began as an edited abridgment from the Latin work of the German Lutheran theologian and philosopher, Johann Franz Budaeus a professor at the University of Jena. Wesley, quote, found occasion to retrench, enlarge, or alter every chapter and almost every section in order to improve it. Wesley always thought that he knew better than authors how things should be done. In 1775, he added material from A History of the Earth and Animated Nature by the Anglo-Irish writer Oliver Goldsmith best known perhaps for his fiction and poetry, including the novel The Vicar of Wakefield, published in 1766. The fourth volume also contained an abridgment of the contemplation of nature by the Swiss naturalist and philosopher Charles Bonnet. And the fifth volume comprises extracts from Louis de Ton's inquiry into the origin of the discoveries attributed to the moderns, 1766. De Ton was a French writer who spent most of his life in Britain. Wesley also referred to a few other available sources, but notes that they are out of date in the light of new discoveries. This is significant because it shows that he valued openness to new knowledge and to scientific discoveries, which enlarged and advanced the knowledge that is obtainable through the scientific method. The contents of the work are difficult to describe because of its encyclopedic nature. Let me provide just a brief summary to give you a sense of what is in this work. Volume one includes a consideration of the human body, its structure and functioning, as well as of the soul. This establishes an anthropological starting point, assuming the centrality of human beings in creation. The brutes are then considered beasts, that is mammals, birds and fish. The consideration of fish continues in the second volume along with reptiles and insects. Plants, metals, and minerals, the last are referred to as fossils, which is an 18th century way of describing minerals of all kinds, make up the rest of the second volume. The third volume is concerned with the elements of earth, water, and fire, including volcanoes, earthquakes, and meteors. 
The heavenly bodies and the properties of natural bodies commence here and continue into the fourth volume, in which it is asserted that God is the first cause of all subsidiary causes, and the relative perfection and gradual progression of beings, and their various relations are considered. The connection between and mutual dependence of the animal and vegetable economy is described, along with the industry of animals, through all of which the wisdom of God is said to be made evident. The fifth volume contains extracts of Dutton's inquiry and include such topics as the circulation of the blood, the functioning of the fallopian tubes, the surgical and chemical practices of the ancients, the sexual system of plants and of nature as active and animated, natural phenomena such as thunder and earthquakes and the tides of the seas and rivers are considered, as well as the properties of magnets and the weight and elasticity of air. Newton's theory of colours and a consideration of gravity, centripetal and centrifugal force, the movements of the planets, the Copernican system of the Earth's movement around the sun, comet, comets and other astronomical topics are all covered. The mathematical and architectural achievements of the ancients are considered, as well as microscopes, sculpture, painting and the origins of music, showing that the subject matter is nothing if not eclectic. The entire work concludes with an appendix on epistemological topics, including the bounds and extent of human understanding, the intellect and its operations, the nature and kinds of evidence, and the improvement of knowledge through revelation. What exactly is the natural philosophy referred to in the title of the survey? First, it needs to be distinguished from natural theology, which among other things sought to provide material from the natural world as supports for the classical proofs of God's existence. Natural philosophy had a different and less apologetic purpose. It was basically the study of the natural world in an era before today's scientific conventions and methods had been firmly established. It sought to explore and highlight the mystery and beauty of the natural world as something divinely designed, eliciting wonder, love and praise. It would be unhelpful to dismiss Wesley's natural philosophy as unscientific quackery, since the conventions of what, con of what constituted the scientific method as we understand it today were still in development in the 18th century. And in any case, these are never in a fixed and permanent state. Scattered throughout the work are instances of strange natural phenomena, which constitute a kind of cabinet of curiosities. Wesley had a fondness for this kind of thing, perhaps because it confounded and chastened human reason, or at least elicited wonder. The impact on the reader is similar to reading a volume of Ripley's Believe It or Not, or the visit of earlier generations to a sideshow carnival exhibiting so-called freaks and curiosities. One of the strangest exhibits was a certain woman whose body was exhumed after 43 years and was found to have been entirely converted into hair. The people, amazed at this appearance, went to touch the corpse, but the shape fell away as it was handled, leaving only a quantity of shapeless hair, but neither flesh nor bones, only a small part of the great toe of the right foot. There are also accounts of men breastfeeding infants to keep them alive in situations of extremity, and very elderly women breastfeeding infants. So that's just an interesting feature of the of the survey, these, this cabinet of curiosities that it presents. One would have to carefully compare the extracts with the original works in order to identify what material is original to Wesley and what is simply cut and paste from his sources. After spending a lot of time in Wesley's writings, one develops a pretty good sense of his voice and some of the pious flourishes do seem to indicate his own hand. But because of this uncertainty, I have used the convention, the survey argues, rather than Wesley argues. Interest in the survey today is largely around how it may be seen as supporting the basic compatibility between evolutionary science and faith. My concern is different. I assume the evolutionary basis of biology and reject any conflict hypothesis between science and religion. The pitting of science and religion against each other, as if they were somehow at odds, or represented entirely incommensurable domains, is a move that I imagine would have left John Wesley quite bemused. Of greater interest to me is how the survey might contribute to the emerging eco-theological work of Wesleyan theologians and, of course, of others. 
Howard Snyder has long argued, has long urged, pardon me, Wesleyan theologians to take eco-theology seriously, most notably in his 2011 book, Salvation Means Creation Healed, co-written with Joel Scandrett. In the Pacific context, the Tongan Methodist minister Sione Amanaki Havea, who died in 2000, proposed what he called a coconut theology that would contextualize theology in the local soil of oceanic cultures. This has informed subsequent contextual theology in the Pacific, including the eco-theological work of Tongan theologian Sione Havea and Fijian Rotaman theologian Seferosa Carroll. It is perhaps unsurprising that oceanic peoples would take an interest in climate science and climate justice, given the existential threat to their homelands represented by global warming. Samoan theologian Upolu Lumavai has drawn upon Wesley's relational theology to call oceanic Methodists to an eco-relational theology. Solomon Islander Cliff Bird has attempted to oceanize Wesleyan theology by providing an ecological ethical reading of John Wesley for Oceanic Methodists. The prolific Salvation Army scholar Matthew Seaman has applied Wesleyan and Salvationist theolog theological insights to a range of environmental concerns. Andrew Dye in his 2022 Cliff College MA thesis on a Wesleyan environmental theology for global mission has argued that the Wesleyan practices of conference and connection lend themselves to a global and contextual polylogue, which enables application of Wesleyan mission to different settings and also provides a process for decolonization of mission theology and practice. And that Wesleyan missional practice must include environmental theology for its integrity, including the environmental synergies of eco-spirituality, evangelism that encompasses good news to creation, and a discipleship that is grounded. The work of these scholars is by no means an exhaustive list of Wesleyan's working on eco-theological themes. It serves only as a representative sample. But I include it here as an indicator of the presence of an intellectual community for whom a fresh reading of Wesley's survey might prove a valuable resource. So how might this rather curious survey serve the purposes of eco-theology in the late Anthropocene? an era in which the human impact on the natural world, especially since the time of the Industrial Revolution, is reaching its limit, resulting in irreversible global warming, rising sea levels and mass extinction of species. I suggest in five ways. One, in its view of the natural world as a display of the wisdom of God. Two, in its stress on the limitations of human knowledge, coupled with the virtue of curiosity about the natural world. Three, in its recognition that animals have souls. Four, in its conviction that there is a divinely given ecological balance in the biosphere. And five, in its recommendation of love for the natural world as a motivating force for creation care. We cannot know much, Wesley writes, but we may love much. Throughout much of Wesley's writings, we observe a body-soul dualism which extends to a disjunction between heaven and earth. There is a later development in his thought, however, that develops a more holistic new creation eschatology in which the material world, including the entire uh, brute creation of animal species, undergoes with humans a divine transformation. There is even a kind of panentheism. For example, in his Sermon 23, the third in his 13 sermon series upon our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, in which we are urged to see, quote, to see the creator in the glass of every creature, we should use and look upon nothing as separate from God, but survey heaven and earth and all that is therein as contained by God in the hollow of God's hand, who by God's intimate presence holds them all in being, who pervades and actuates the whole created frame and is in a true sense the soul of the universe. This brings to mind the sort of process theology concept of the universe as God's body or God as the divine soul of the material world. In a manner similar to Paley's watchmaker analogy, readers of the survey are urged to see the wisdom of God in the design of creation. When we observe the variety of humanly made machines, such as clocks and watches and pumps, we see human wisdom on display. How much more do we see the divine wisdom of the Almighty declared in such a multitude of different sorts of creatures? Quote, the beauty of creatures is given them either for their own sake, that they themselves may be delighted with it, 
or for ours, that we may observe in them the amazing power and goodness of the Creator. It is certainly our duty to take notice of and admire them. In short, the whole universe is a picture in which are displayed the perfections of the deity. Close quote. As noted earlier, the survey has been seen as providing theological support for evolutionary biology, though, of course, Darwin's groundbreaking on the origin of species would not appear until 1859. But in a section entitled The Laws of Nature Sufficient for the Production of Animals and Vegetables, we read that it does not detract from the glory of divine providence to represent the great engine of this visible world as moving onward in its appointed course without the continual interposure of God's hand. God is active in nature according to uniform laws, so that nature moves forward for thousands of years at a time under the influence of natural processes and without constant divine intervention. While Wesley does not take account of the destructive impact on the environment of human industry, his view of nature as operating according to observable laws matches the scientific approach to our understanding of the impact of climate change and may serve as an encouragement to employ science and technology to reverse its impact. Now to move to the souls of animals. Ted Runyon has described Wesley as placing no absolute difference between humanity and other animals. I have argued elsewhere that there is a post-human element to Wesley's teleology, in that while holding to the traditional view of humanity as positioned at the top of the chain of being, he also holds the possibility of animals bearing the image of God in the new creation, according to their capacities. He anticipated a time when the rationality, affectivity, and volitional capacities of non-human species would be expanded to enable unprecedented non-human enjoyment of God. He did not limit God's saving purposes to the human species, but saw other sentient beings, and even things without sentience, as the objects of God's providential action, and as participants in the new creation. Without dislodging humanity from its role as a unique image bearer, he broadened the scope of eschatological expectation well beyond the salvation of souls to a restored material universe in which the forces of nature are perfectly balanced, no longer the target of rapacious human exploitation. His eschatology is therefore post-human in the sense that it is situated after the Anthropocene and does not limit God's saving purpose to the fate of human beings alone. Of course, the idea that animals do not have souls is a particularly modern conceit. It was not the view of pre-modern theologians, many of whom wrote extensively about the spiritual capacities of animals. Indigenous cultures universally understand that humans hold a kinship relationship to animals. The Enlightenment claim that animals have no souls and the subsidiary claim that they exist primarily for human exploitation and use has had a widespread destructive impact on animal populations leading to the mass extinction of species. In addition, while humans have always hunted and domesticated animals for food, until modern times, this has taken place at sustainable levels and within human-animal kinship networks of respect and reverence. The massive industrial scale of food production has now led to the moral crisis of billions of animals whose existence is entirely framed and controlled by the human preference for hamburgers in fast food drive through lanes. The suffocating fear and cruelty experienced by our animal kin, kin is hidden away from our sight, but not from the sight of God, who knows and loves all that God has created. Several parts of the survey reject the concept that animals act purely out of mere mechanism. Quote, we cannot deny that there is something in brutes which perceives the impressions made by outward objects and that they perform a thousand actions which can never be explained by mere mechanism. Common sense and everyday experience assure us that animals experience both pain and pleasure. And the fact that we are distressed when we observe animal distress, but not at all distressed at the destruction of plant matter, is given as further proof that animals possess some degree of reason. Animals are even said to have the capacity to enjoy music, and amusing anecdotes are given about horses and cows gathering in a field to enjoy a French horn recital, dogs sustaining, quote, a very ridiculous part in a concert, a caged lion in Edinburgh being pacified by the sound of the bagpipes, not sure how the bagpipes would pacify any living creature, and a German flute 
having the same effect on lions and tigers in the Tower of London. A soldier in a French prison found that when he played his lute, the mice and spiders who shared his confinement would come out from their hiding places to give heed to the music, retiring again when he stopped. Now, while there may be a scientific basis for animal attraction to music, the survey recounts such instances in an anecdotal fashion without offering any scientific analysis. So a Wesleyan eco-theology, and I would suggest any eco-theology, must take account of the impact of climate change on non-human animals and contribute to a shift away from the exploitative relationship toward them that has been a feature of colonization and industrialization. Wesley's understanding of animals as having souls and of their capacity to bear the image of God in the new creation opens the way for the industrialized world to recover its kinship relationship toward other animals. Species extinction is directly related to human greed and to the myth of endless production of wealth. Natural resources are not endless, and only renewable forms of energy production can make way for the flourishing of that rich biosphere divinely intended by the creator. How else may we, quote, with pleasure behold the glorious works of God, view the beauties of the flowery fields, the gay attire and exquisite garniture of many creatures, and with admiration see the great creator's wonderful art, and behold the harmony of this lower world and of the globes above, surveying God's exquisite workmanship in every creature. I move on to, this, to explore the theme of ecological balance as a divinely given feature of the environment. Throughout the survey, there is the assumption of a divinely designed ecological balance among species, which resonates with our contemporary concern for the effects of overpopulation. As noted earlier, there is no anticipation of the destructive disruption of this ecological balance brought on by the Industrial Revolution. Wesley, of course, is living only in the very early stages of that movement. There is, however, an assumption that the preservation of ecological balance is part of God's providential care for creation. For example, the long lives of the patriarchs and matriarchs are said to have been abridged by divine command in order to keep the earth from being overstocked with human inhabitants to the extent that the food supply would be threatened. Every species, whether a plant or animal, owes something of its existence to other species in what Wesley or the survey calls a just community in nature, which suffers nothing to subsist merely for itself. It is even supposed that the sum total of organic and biological materials has remained the same since creation. Such, quote, original particles, indestructible and common to all organized beings, pass from body to body, supporting the life and ministering to the nutrition and growth of each. The organic material of deceased organisms survive and pass into other beings, bringing with them nourishment and life. Thus, every production, every renovation, every increase by generation or nutrition supposes a preceding destruction, a conversion of substance, an accession of these organical particles, which ever subsisting in an equal number, render nature always equally full of life. The total quantity of life in the universe is therefore perpetually the same. That beings may succeed each other, it is necessary that there be a destruction among them. Yet, like a provident mother, mother nature in the midst of her inexhaustible abundance has prevented any waste. Such mutual codependence is the decree of the great parent of all. The present destruction of habitats, mass species extinction, increased levels of carbon in the atmosphere, and industrial scale destruction of animal life in the food chain, all challenge this view of a divinely preserved natural equilibrium. If God is preserving a just community of nature so that the balance of all life is preserved, God is clearly not doing a very good job at it. A just community of nature may be a good description of the pre-industrialized world where small-scale crop production and hunting existed at sustainable levels within a meaning-making network of human connection to the land, water, sky, and all their creatures, a life pattern referred to by the First Nations people of Australia as living on country. But in the late Anthropocene, this system has been seriously disrupted by the exploitation and depletion of the world's resources, driven by the myth of endless production, 
and the moral bankruptcy that increasingly concentrates the world's wealth into the hands of a few at the expense of the many. If, however, the ecological balance of the Earth's resources is at least the divine intention, as the survey argues, it is a Christian ethical imperative to work for the restoration of this balance. Another theme that runs through the survey is the limits of human knowledge. All we know is very little in comparison of what remains unknown. This awareness should, this awareness should prompt us still more diligently to inquire after truth. How extremely little can we possibly know either of the largest or smallest part of the creation? Proofs of a wise, a good, a powerful being are indeed deducible from everything around us. We are sensible. All our reasonings about the wonderful operations of nature are so full of uncertainty. But although we can never hope to come to the bottom of the first principle of things, yet may we everywhere see plain signatures of the hand of a divine architect. So one of the most interesting aspects of the survey is its argument that the absence of knowledge concerning the created world is no barrier to our loving it. Quote, everything is calculated by divine wisdom to make us wiser and better. And this is the substance of true philosophy. We cannot know much. In vain does our shallow reason attempt to fathom the mysteries of nature and pry into the secrets of the almighty whose ways are past finding out. The eye of a little worm is a subject capable capable of exhausting all boasted speculations. But we may love much, and herein we may be assisted by contemplating the wonders of creation. A little while ago uh, in an ISCAS seminar, Lisa Sedaris, professor of environmental studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, spoke to us about the monarch butterfly, which is currently a threatened species in California and subject to careful conservation laws. And she described how groups of people will stand before the trees where the butterflies roost in large numbers in a kind of hushed and awed silence, evidencing the wonder that humans experience in the presence of nature. Sedaris is interested in the way that religion and science connect through the ethical considerations of natural processes and environmental values. Wildlife conservationists understand that love of the natural world and its creatures can be a powerful motivating factor in recruitment. Love is central to Wesley's theology of sanctification and lies at the center of his entire religious outlook. It is unsurprising, perhaps, that it should also appear in his natural philosophy, where it is privileged over intellectual certainty. Quote, in this, our infant state, we cannot know much, but we may love much. Let us secure this point, and we shall soon be swallowed up in the ocean of both knowledge and love. Close quote. I do have to report, though, that there are some problems with the survey, which make it less helpful for the purposes of, a, of an eco-theology in the present era. These discussed here include scientific inaccuracies, a certain anthropocentrism that relegates non-human animals to a utilitarian role, and assumptions about the inferiority of non-European peoples. Okay. Seem to have lost a page. Okay, I've lost a little bit of the presentation, but that's all right. I'm happy to circulate it after the seminar if Doro would like to circulate it um, to participants. But there are obviously factual errors uh, the, the length and the height of hippopotamuses and elephants and other creatures, what is inside a camel's hump. These things, we kind of smile at them because now we know that they're inaccurate. They may have been the present knowledge of the 18th century, but they've since been superseded by current knowledge. There are also cures that are uh, recited, such as the cure for a scorpion bite, which is to play the flute and the bagpipe with the brisk beat of a drum, or to bruise the scorpion and bind it to the wound. As for the bite of a tarantula, there is only one remedy, a musician plays several tunes, and when the right note is struck, the victim will begin to dance for upwards of six hours before collapsing from exhaustion and then beginning again in a pattern of involuntary dancing that lasts six or seven days. Such content we would today relegate to the category of folklore. It is said with the utmost seriousness that if a pregnant woman is struck by a mulberry or strawberry, 
a birthmark will appear on the skin of the child in the same spot where the mother was struck. My own grandmother had a story like this where a spider fell on her face while she was pregnant with my mother. And that when my mother was born, she swears that there was a birthmark like a spider on my mother's face, which faded over time. Furthermore, as the berries change colour through the season, so the child's birthmark will change from green to yellow to red in sync with the berry's life cycle. Similarly, if a pregnant woman is suddenly frightened by the moon, a moon-shaped figure will appear on her child which will wax and wane with the lunar cycle. Pointing out features of the survey which would today be understood as unscientific does not invalidate its value or its use in its 18th century context. It does, however, highlight its limitations as a resource for a contemporary eco-theology, which should be built not only on sound theological principles, but also on the best available scientific research. Now to anthropocentrism. For all of its admirable ascription of a degree of reason within animals, there is also a clear anthropocentrism at work. Animals exist primarily as human property, and their behaviours are often seen as designed by the creator for the benefit and convenience of humans. The varieties of shapes and colours in animals are reduced to commodities when they are said to be doubtless intended for the sake of man to prevent confusion and decide and ascertain his property. No, that black and white cow, that's mine. That black one over there, that's yours. Salmon lice are described as insects wisely designed by the creator to drive this rich and valuable fish into the hands of men. Why do those fish, which are the fittest for the use of man, come and offer themselves on our coasts, while so many that would be useless, if not pernicious, affect remoteness from us? What hand conducts them with so much care and goodness but thine, O thou preserver of men? Any Wesleyan eco-theology today would have to reject this anthropocentric view and assert the value of non-human animals for their own sake, regardless of any particular benefit they might bring to humans. And the final problematic theme is the assumption of European superiority. There are undoubtedly problematic reflections on non-European peoples within the survey that show that Wesley and those whom he read were situated in what are now for us troubling assumptions about the superiority of white people and their culture. Humanity is described as, quote, the most perfect animal and is divided into but three or four species. While these so-called species are not identified, it is likely that the terms refer to the widely used division of Caucasoid, Negroid, and Mongoloid, which equate roughly speaking to white, black, and Asian. Such terms are highly offensive today even though Caucasian is still used in the United States to identify a white person. We now consider race more in terms of cultural and social construction than of biology, but in the 18th century, it was situated within natural philosophy. In discussing the properties of the skin, some strange cases are noted, including an 11-year-old boy in Virginia, probably the child of slaves, born to African parents, who at three years of age developed white spots, which increased over the years until they were, quote, wonderfully white, equal to the skin of the fairest lady. A second case was given of a woman in Maryland with skin, quote, as dark as the most swarthy African, who also developed whiteness on her skin until four-fifths of her skin was white, smooth, and transparent, as in a fair European. It is hard to escape the impression that such a change in skin colour was noted on the assumption that white skin was the preferred hue. In discussing reasons why the African zebra has never been domesticated, the observation is made that the animal exists in countries where, quote, the human inhabitants are but little raised above the quadruped. For the inhabitants of Angola, or Caffraria, probably a reference to the former British colony of Caffraria in present-day South Africa, the delicate colourings of the zebra have no allurements to a race of people who only consider the quantity of flesh and not its conformation, conformation. The delicacy of the zebra's shape or the painted elegance of its form are no more regarded by such than by the lion that makes it his prey. The meat of the pelican is said to be so disagreeable that not even Native, Native Americans will eat it, as it is, quote, not, even, not fit even for the banquet of a savage. 
A racist myth extending back as far as the Middle Ages is perpetuated that chimpanzees, quote, often assault and ravage the Negro women when they meet them in the woods. This has the effect of dehumanizing uh, African women as if they could be mistaken as sexual partners by orangutans in the bush. Sorry, I've lost my place again. Sorry, my document's jumping all over the place. The challenges of reading something off your iPhone. Okay. Perhaps the most objectionable treatment of race in the survey is the description given in volume four of the gradual progression of beings, excerpted from the Swiss naturalist Charles Bonnet's contemplation of nature. And uh, perhaps a trigger warning is called for here for the very offensive language that I'm about to read. After asserting that humanity possesses the highest degree of earthly perfection, it is also claimed that the species of men have gradations, constituting a prodigious number of continued links between the most perfect man and the ape. To the Lapland dwarf, let the giant of Madagascar succeed. Let the flat-faced African with his black complexion and woolly hair give place to the European, whose regular features are set off by the whiteness of his complexion and beauty of his hair. To the filthiness of the Hottentot, a derogatory term referred to referring to the Koi Koi people of the Cape of Good Hope, oppose the neatness of a Dutchman, from the cruel cannibal past to the humane Frenchman. Place the stupid Huron opposite the profound Englishman, the Huron being a race of Native Americans, or a tribe, pardon me, of Native Americans. Ascend from the Scotch peasant to the great Isaac Newton. <laughs> Even the Scots are considered inferior to the English. Descend from the harmony of George Frederick Handel to the rustic songs of the shepherd. Put in the same scale the locksmith constructing a jack and Jacques du Vaucasson's automatons, automations, which were early experiments in robotic technology. Reckon up the number of steps from the smith that causes the anvil to groan to René Ramour anatomizing fire. Now, the survey quickly moves to assert that notwithstanding these physical and intellectual differences, each of these supposed gradations possesses a fully human soul. Still, the overt racism here is simply staggering. Even if these are the words of Bonnet rather than Wesley, the fact that they pass through Wesley's careful editorial hand and were published under his name constitutes a challenge for contemporary Methodists who wish to decolonize the veneration of the founder's memory. Wesley is well known for his opposition to slavery and the positive descriptions of Africans as morally superior to the average European, which occurs in his thoughts upon slavery, 1774. These reflections served a valuable polemical function. Sorry, I've lost, lost it again. Um, a valuable polemical function in his opposition to slavery. Um, and they were designed to counter those arguments that the slave trade did Africans a favor by taking them from a benighted existence and placing them on plantations where they could hear the gospel, learn to read and benefit and, and, and benefit from um, uh, European civilization. I'm almost there, folks. At the same time, as Natalia Cherry has convincingly argued, anti-slavery discourse was not free of racist assumptions, as there existed both racist pro-slavery and racist anti-slavery sentiments. Even when speaking up for the dignity and rights of African peoples, Wesley still drew on racializing frameworks and the assumptions of imperialism. David N. Field has shown that Wesley could speak both favorably and negatively about African peoples, depending on his particular theological and rhetorical purposes. 
In each case, he othered Africans, whether the inhabitants of West Africa or the Koei Koei of the Cape of Good Hope, in a manner that upheld European ideas about the superiority of the latter's own virtues and values. The inclusion in the survey of material that assumes the racial inferiority of non-Europeans suggests that Wesley was embedded in a culture of white supremacy, even if, like many today, he could not always recognise it. Now, my conclusion, you'll all be glad to hear me say that word. John Wesley's survey of the wisdom of God in creation, in spite of its very real limitations, may serve as a helpful resource for, e resource for eco theology in the late Anthropocene. The natural world is a complex display of the wisdom of God, which elicits curiosity and remains a fit subject for human inquiry. It is no longer the case that such inquiry is solely the domain of scientists amateur or otherwise. Given the very real threat of global warming, habitat degradation and species extinction, the study of the natural world in order to address such crises is an urgent moral obligation incumbent upon all people. The stress in the survey on the limitations of human knowledge is a helpful reminder that more than human ingenuity is needed to address the ecological challenges before us. The teleological thrust of Wesleyan thought provides reason to hope that there is a divine hand in the scientific and technological advances that may serve to address the threat of climate change and avert disaster. Wesleyan creation theology looking, sorry, Wesleyan creation theology is also new creation theology, looking not to the recovery of a lost paradise, but to a new heaven and a new earth, a perfected universe in which the glorified human will, quote, transport himself at pleasure into every point of space and will fly from planet to planet with the swiftness of lightning, close quote. In the survey's recognition that non-human animals have souls, and in Wesley's conjecture that animals may eventually bear the image of God according to their capacities, we have the basis for a post-human embrace of our animal kin. The exploitation of animals on an industrial scale must end as we move to a more plant-based and small-scale sustainable and local food economy, marked by love of other creatures as the beloved of God, along whom we stand in organic connection. The survey's view that God carefully maintains a just distribution of organic material in a symbiotic mutuality that benefits and sustains the entire planetary ecosystem seems now to be a naive outlook. It does, however, provide a compelling vision of what the world could be or perhaps will be in God's time. Such a state will not be produced, however, by divine fiat. God will work by persuasion, not coercion, to invite those who bear the Imago Dei to the genuine stewardship of creation that constitutes our ecological responsibility. In the survey's highlighting of love for the natural world, we find a profoundly motivating force. While we cannot know all that can be known about the threatened state of the world, nor even apprehend the scale of the problems we face, we can love without limit. There is no restriction placed on our capacity to love, at least no restriction that cannot be overcome by divine grace. The more perfectly we love the natural world and embrace the lands, waters and skies along with all their creatures as our divinely intended habitat. And this is where indigenous theological perspectives are so valuable and so important for all of us. The more we embrace lands, waters and skies along with all their creatures as our divinely intended habitat, the more will fear be cast out and the sooner will the just community of nature be restored. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, this was a fascinating uh, introduction to uh, John Wesley's uh, uh, views of uh, nature. I, I think uh, uh, this is such an important approach, methodologically speaking, uh, because uh, uh, with the culture wars of, uh, of our times, uh, we tend to uh, uh, discard altogether something that uh, includes, I don't know what information, uh, out of date information, or I don't know what uh, views, uh, without uh, discerning that uh, there are gems that are important things there. Uh, it's something that I uh, 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 have to tackle in my line of work, uh, you know, working with pat uh, patristic material, when I find very similar um, uh, issues uh, from uh, uh, out-of-date information to outrageous interpretations. Uh, but 
this is uh, this is uh, uh, the way ahead. I, I assume you know. Uh, let's uh, look for those gems that can inspire. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, an, an ecological vision where we Christians uh, might have something significant to do. Uh, and instead of reinventing the wheel, we can build on um, uh, the foundations that were already laid out, in this case, by John Wesley. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, now, uh, where's Mick? Uh, let's, let's hear uh, from, from him uh, a response to, to Glenn's presentation. Thanks, Dover. I'd like to begin my response to Glenn's fascinating presentation by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, whose unceded lands I live on, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples on this call. As, to borrow Anne Elvie's phrase, a budding eco-theologian, I have paid some small attention to Wesley. Further, and having recently moved from the Anglican to Uniting Church, one might say I followed in his footsteps. Like Glenn, I wonder if we might call Wesley an eco-theologian. And like him, I am interested in resources for the Anthropocene. As he notes, this is a contested term. Apart from debates on whether the Anthropocene begins with the origins of agriculture, the Industrial Revolution, or the Great Acceleration, a recent meeting of the International Subcommission on Quaternary St Stratigraphy has rejected the notion that we live in a new epoch, but remain firmly in the Holocene. There is already a challenge among geologists who believe that the vote was not legitimate. Be that as it may, the Anthropocene remains a, a cultural concept that describes the era of accelerating human impacts and calls for all the cultural tools we can bring to bear. Clive Hamilton believes the unprecedented changes in the Anthropocene mean that no previous cultural learning can prepare us to deal with them. This includes all Holocene religions. It might be acknowledged that some forms of Christianity are certainly guilty of such shortcomings. In particular, one must acknowledge the shortcomings in American evangelicalism and apocalypti oh, sorry, uh, apocalyptism that have aligned with capitalism in reinforcing the problem of the Anthropocene. But how does Wesley help? I think that Wesley's interest in science as an amateur, in keeping with the involvement of the clergy of his time, is not to be dismissed. Before the modern academy, with both its professionalism and agnosticism, natural philosophy was an attempt to keep together what has now been torn apart. Such an endeavour has represented most of my adult life and represents the task of organisations such as his cast, of whom Dora and I are members. Amateur scientists have much to offer. It is citizen scientists who alerted the academy to the decline of flying insects in Germany, while Jane Goodall, was able to make her observations of chimpanzee culture and use of technology unclouded by established prejudices. While Wesley was more a collector of ideas than a maker of careful observations, his desire to bring science, and an anachronistic term here, as Glenn notes, with theology make him a progenitor, or makes him rather, of eco-theologians. While his scientific misunderstandings are understandable for the age in which he lived, they do cloud his theological conclusions. A natural philosopher is as much interested in the whys of the natural world than the hows, and the two are indeed linked. One fertile text for eco-theological reflection from Wesley, which illustrates some of the weaknesses that Glenn has pointed out, is his sermon on Romans 8, The Great Deliverance. The title indicates that his expectation for non-humans is a positive one. There are, however, three problems with his exegesis. The first is that Wesley assumes that human sin has affected the state of animals, not just in relation to us, but in their own internal constitution. In doing so, Wesley is wildly speculative. According to him, quote, what did the meaner creature suffer when man rebelled against God? It is probable that they sustained much loss, even in the lower faculties, their vigor, strength, and swiftness, end quote. Wesley also claimed that even, quote, insects and worms had then as much understanding as the most intelligent brutes have now, end quote. Such an idea is biologically naive, but also pushes a reading of Romans 8 well beyond anything Paul could have had in mind. Wesley's second problem is that he was unaware of evolution, and indeed, how could he have been? Rather than seeing animal anatomy as an adaptation for predation or scavenging, 
or even in Paley's, in Paley's sense, um, his revulsion is obvious when he states, quote, is not the outward appearance of many of the creatures as horrid as their dispositions, end quote. Now, while it is true uh, predation causes suffering, Wesley engages in unhelpful anthropomorphizing and moralizing over the behavior of carnivores. He speaks, quote, of, quote, savage fierceness, unrelenting cruelty, and refers to some creatures as unrelenting monsters. Wesley was quite ignorant of the role of predators in properly functioning ecosystems. Third, Wesley's exegesis is selective. Part of his basis for a divine concern for animals is his discussion of Psalm 104 and God's provision in that he, quote, giveth grass for the cattle, end quote, for example. However, he fails to mention verses 20 to 22, uh, where, which speaks of God providing young lions their food. While this does not judge against an eco-eschaton of non-predation, that's a possibility, it does at least establish divine concern in the present state for carnivores, as carnivores. In the broader context of the psalm, God has established a place for everything and everything in its place. So see, for example, verses 16 to 23. One might argue that God limits the destructive capabilities of non-human carnivores, but accommodates this function into his plan. Wesley turns to Psalm 104 to garner emotional support for his claim that animals will be redeemed, but he does not balance this against Genesis 1 and 2. Psalm 104 supports the theology of the created order as having parts totally independent of human society, viewed, that is, from the agrarian view of ancient Israel. Wesley, however, sees the effects of the fall such that, quote, brutes are deprived of their perfection, their loving obedience to man, end quote. Even under a strong stewardship understanding of creation, it goes beyond the creation texts to suggest that all animals are to be obedient to humans. Indeed, Psalm 104 implies they are obedient to God. All this affects how Wesley understands the eschaton, or end times, and what it would mean for God to restore non-human creatures to their former glory, whatever that might mean. I think that the above considerations call for careful consideration of how exactly we see the wisdom of God in the world. Something I affirm, uh, when the world is subject to suffering, death and extinction, quite apart from that which humans are causing. So the 4.5 billion years of Earth history. We might laud Wesley's attempts while noting that both scientific and theological knowing is provisional and through a glass dimly, as Paul notes. One last consideration, um, which Glenn brought to our attention, and I refer back to my acknowledgement of country as being rather pointed, is Wesley's racism. We might ask, do we cancel Wesley? That's a rather serious question uh, in today's parlance. In colonised Australia, any attempt to deal with the Anthropocene is to recognise, as Zoe Todd and Heather Davis do, that the ideological origins of the Anthropocene lie in settler co colonialism and the origins of capitalism, hence the preferred term, capitalocene. Capitalocene work is intersectional work. It is, post, it is a post-colonial discipline, even if not carried out in a post-colonial reality. We need to leave behind a view of the, quote, great chain of being, end quote, that does not recognise all humans as full image bearers of God. Wesley's rejection of slavery, while holding these racist views, indicates that his thinking was not fully coherent. But then again, which theologian can claim that theirs is? I suggest that, like most do with the various traditions that make up the Hebrew Bible, we adopt a Christological reading of Wesley. There is a canon within a canon. We recognize his time-bound nature and the incompleteness of his thought, as we should indeed do with our own. Finally, then, I'm grateful for Glenn bringing it to my attention that there are hints of panentheism within Wesley's thought, the subject of my own PhD. For in seeing God as one who, quote, pervades and actuates the whole created frame and is, in a true sense, the soul of the universe, end quote, we see the key to elevating all creatures as image bearers. Surely this will be, necess be a necessary recognition in providing us with rich resources for life in the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, <laughs> great points there. 
uh, yeah, perhaps uh, uh, Glenn's interpretation of uh, Wesley as uh, projecting uh, everything uh, or perfection as we uh, conceive of uh, eschatologically uh, is definitely applicable to theology too. Uh, but again, this uh, brings me back to the topic of a selective discerning approach to uh, uh, what uh, the founders of uh, uh, modern theology uh, had to say uh, on matters of uh, nature and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, it would be good to see uh, uh, afterthoughts. So you heard each other's um, uh, points and uh, I invite you to uh, take over and uh, converse freely. Well, I would just say thank you to Mick for taking the time to read my paper and to respond to it so well. And um, every one of the points that you made, Mick, you know, I found very salient. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, there's no, I don't think any dissonance in our approaches there, which is good. Um, and um, and going back to Doro's comments about how, you know, we we see the, faults and foibles of even the greatest theologians it's it's an important distinction isn't it between john wesley's theology and wesleyan theology they're not the same thing wesleyan theology is not just restating what john wesley said as if he was some kind of oracle whose words need only to be quoted but key themes within his ideas are built upon and have been built upon in the intervening centuries so a Wesleyan theologian has to be current and has to develop Wesley's ideas and is perfectly at liberty to say that John Wesley was wrong. But I think there is a certain type of culture amongst Methodists um, where it's not it's not considered you know appropriate or it's not welcomed to call into question the, you know or to raise the possibility that John Wesley might have been wrong, not just about science but certain of his theological ideas. <laughs> you know. Uh, the idea, I mean, Wesley's actually a very inconsistent theologian. He thinks, he, he always said things like, I have taught this way for the last 40 years. I have never changed my mind. If you read my writings going back to the 1740s, you'll find that I haven't changed my mind, which is rubbish. He changed his mind about all sorts of things. And you can trace it quite easily. And there's even footnote references to later editions of the sermons where he'll say things like, um, oh, I'm surprised that my brother and I were not hung by the neck until dead for saying such things. Or he'll say, we used to think that, we think it no longer. So clearly he does change his mind and there is some inconsistency. But there are some Wesleyan theologians who seem to think that John Wesley is some kind of Thomas Aquinas-like figure who writes a summa. Of course, Wesley never did write theology in a systematic mode. It's letters and sermons and journal entries and it's actually more patristic in a sense in that way. It's more like Luther who writes occasionally and polemically and he doesn't sit down and say, okay, let's write a systematic theology from A to Z. And, and, and there have been even some theologians who have wanted to kind of put Wesley's ideas into a systematic theological format and have published works that do that, start with prolegomena and move to eschatology and put everything into those, you know, categories, which to me is wrong-headed. That's the wrong way of thinking about it. Much better to sort of receive all the messiness of John Wesley as the, you know, the horseback riding itinerant evangelist that he was. I mean, William Abraham, Billy Abraham, one of the great Wesleyan theologians of our era, you know, even argued before his sad passing that we need to stop talking about John Wesley as a theologian at all. And we need to talk of him as a saint, think of him as a saint and appropriate his, him in, as a saint rather than as a theologian. That, and that's a really interesting insight. Um, but anyway, just a few thoughts there on, on um, how we might develop Wesleyan theology, not simply by mimicking him, but by seizing upon some of his brilliant ideas and developing them into other directions. Would this be amenable to you, Mick? Well, I'm probably jumping into the more dangerous waters, and I think that's the the approach to. I mean, in, in talking about Wesley's writing, you're talking about Paul's writings. Uh, Romans is not a systematic text. Romans is dealing with a real problem of I need funding to go to Spain to evangelize. 
Oh, and by the way, you and Rome need to get yourself together about the fact that the, there aren't so many Jews uh, amongst your congregation, and here are the reasons why. So, and and I think I may have even said that in my well, I did say that in my paper. And I, so, I, for example, I take the holiness tradition in Leviticus over the Deuteronomy because it's far more inclusive um, in in its outlook of those outside the people of Israel. So we do this all the time. And I, um, clearly, whenever, well, not absolutely whenever, but oftentimes when the science the Bible makes a quote unquote scientific statement, it's wrong. We don't live in a three tiered universe. We know we don't do. Uh, anyone who maintains that is a wooden literalist and, and doesn't understand what, for example, Genesis 1 is trying to say. So there is a, the texts are different. I just, uh, Wesley doesn't doesn't claim to be writing scripture that scripture writers do. But nonetheless, the way in which we develop themes that are appropriate for our times, and your, your point, I think, was appropriate earlier, Doru, that we can't reject the current zeitgeist. You can't ignore the issues or we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. Um, the idea of the Anthropocene was not in the purview of Paul when he wrote Romans, but he could certainly see the effects of the empire on the environment. Um, there is certainly earth-shedding theology to be found in in the book of Genesis uh, and the whole understanding, and I'm riffing off my master's here, of uh, keeping Sabbath as a way of c containing the forces of chaos. So the biblical texts and in, indeed the, the patristics all the way through to Wesley, etc., are not irrelevant in these discussions, but we need to continue to um bring out old treasures and new if you will um i should say just as a complete aside um if it sounded like i'd spent a lot of time reading wesley's uh sermon i'd already written a book chapter on romans 8 <laughs> so that was kind of pre-prepared and i could cut and paste um so yeah i think we're on the same page uh that i think of all the things you could quote unquote cancel someone for i'm not saying racism is benign but he is such a a mixed bag that a with regards to the theology of the individual we do need to pick and choose and set aside and contextualize the man but b you're right you develop a tradition you work within a tradition um and you let that tradition develop so i i'm, I'm just intrigued that people want to elevate wesley as to this um this uh what's the word i'm looking for infallible source in the same way doro we've had a discussion about many orthodox churches in the same way in which it's done I have the great advantage of having come to faith at 18 uh, in a university setting and not been raised a Christian. And I've picked up and put down theology like you wouldn't believe. And so not because, you know, I'm a, I'm a paper pope or a pope in name and, and feel like what I'm doing is carries absolute weight, but simply because I don't, I'm not embedded in a tradition and feel free to uh, examine things. I don't want to sound arrogant about this, but you know what I mean? I'm not, I don't feel tradition bound, uh, which is almost worse. In, in a sense so you're free floating and it's like you're just picking and choosing what suits you but we all do that and just sometimes we we lock down a tradition and say that's it good i don't have to think anymore um, yeah well it's very patristic of you because uh, 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 uh most of the early christian yeah. theologians were uh eclectic in their approach to uh let's say the broader uh cultural landscape Thank you, thank you uh, both for for sharing. Let, let's see if there are any questions from uh, from the audience. Any comments? Neil, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Doro, and thank you, Glenn, and, and Nick, for your response. Just uh, I mean, there was interesting discussion there. You're saying John Wesley's not a systematic theologian, and I think that could be said of a lot of religious writing. You know. We not technically theology, it's religious writing of some sort. Um, just the the discussion of, you know, do animals have souls is a good example of the difference between religious writing and actual systematic thinking. Because the term soul in general thought is just not defined. Like it, it's, we presume we know what it means, but we don't. So the notion that uh, other living things had souls was completely consistent with what Aristotle said. Aristotle said every living thing has a soul because a soul is a form of a living thing. Like it's not, um, and he could do that because he had a system, he had a metaphysical system that allowed him to control the meanings of the terms that he was using. 
And unless you have that sort of systematic control of meaning, to ask a question like, do animals have souls, is meaningless. It's simply meaningless because you can't control the basic meanings of the terms you're using. And for Aristotle, it's not a question of whether living things have souls, but what sort of souls do they have, which is a different question. So uh, I get a little bit frustrated because I think as theologians, we should be more sophisticated in the use of our language and the use of our understanding of what the issues are. Because it is like if we continue to use general terms as if we all know what they mean, then arguments are unending and unsolvable. Like unless we have some degree of control of the meaning or recognize that we're operating within different fields of discourse, you know, we might might, we might be Platonists and we might think of a dualism or we might be Cartesian and think of the body as a mechanism and the soul as some disembodied thing, whatever. But these are different discourses. These are different realms of discourses. And unless we recognise that and, and locate ourselves, sorry, because unless we locate ourselves within a tradition of thought in that regard, we don't actually talk, we just simply talk at cross purposes. So just some clarity of, of categories there is really important. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you know, the question of souls is not a question of whether they do, but what is the nature of the souls that they bear? And that leads to a discussion of the potencies and uh, uh, habits and forms that that soul has, the capabilities that it has. So that's when you can start talking intelligently about whether they image God or not. Uh, so anyway, just me having a rant. Uh, it's one of my favourite topics that you know, we have so many theological discussions where we simply do not control the basic meanings of the terms that we're using. And we can discuss endlessly because we're not actually talking about the same things. Thanks. Yeah, I, I do take that point and, um, and essentially op I'm operating out of the, I, I accept absolutely the premise that, especially for medieval writers and others, an ant has an ant soul, a worm has a worm's soul, and they're not the same thing as a human soul. Um, and also, of course, we have the contemporary scepticism about any kind of dualism between a body and a soul in the sense that the, there's a serious question of a whether a person is a person, if separated, if you know whether body and soul can be even separated things, um, there's a questioning of the whole sort of Cartesian distinction between body and soul, that dualism. So I, I totally take that point. I guess in my presentation, I am I was highlighting that larger cultural assumption. Let's call it a Cartesian idea about human beings being in a possessing reason and therefore being at the top of the pyramid of beings and the negative impact on on animals of that human conceit if you like um i think there is a connection there that perhaps older forms of theology were not as subject to that very sharp distinction because they valued the souls of animals though of course they were different from the souls of human beings. Wesley's suggestion that animals could bear the image of God in the new creation is a, a very radical concept. Um, he makes the point that animals share many of the same capacities as human beings, but what they don't share presently is the capacity to enjoy God. And then he makes this shift of saying, in the new creation, they will have what they do not currently have, the capacity to enjoy God. And if the capacity to enjoy God is the one thing that meant animals did not possess the image of God, if they are given that capacity, then they suddenly become creatures that can bear the image of God. But after their capacities, not in the same way that a human being might, but in a way that an animal, a particular type of life might reflect God's image. I see Matthew has his hand raised. Yes. 
Hello, Matthew. It's good to see you. Yes, good to see you, Professor O'Brien. <laughs> thank you very much for the paper, and uh, thank you, Professor Pope, for the for the, the conversation. I have one question, and also um, <clears throat> one comment about uh, John Wesley as a theologian. Uh, the, my question is actually. Um, of some some kind of a historical uh, you know inquiry about whether John Wesley has been uh, inconsistent about the positive uh, description of Africans after his uh, thought upon slavery. Like, has he held languages like we find in the survey of the wisdom? Uh, <clears throat> uh, after 1774. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, that, that has happened. Uh, in, in my previous reading, I know that he has held languages like that even prior to the service of, uh, I mean, survey of the wisdom in, in his 1750s multiple edition of uh, the doctrine of original sin right so some of the languages there are very uh word per word the first i mean languages that can be found in the first uh british explorers <laughs> description of africans very negative i mean some of them he even said that they don't have you no know, they don't have a head, <laughs> stuff like that. So, and it's there is a sense that he was copying, you know, he was siding with the anthropologists of the day, and that's also what he he does in in the, in seventeen sixties uh, with the survey of the wisdom. But has he done the same thing after 70, 1774 when he after he wrote the the thought upon slavery. It's something that I'm genuinely wondering about. Uh, then that will strengthen the case of inconsistency. Uh, if not, then uh, one could say that, you know, this is somebody who has been led by, misled by bad philosophies, and then uh, he, he got a better reading uh, and, uh, and stick with with uh, a better description of God's humanity. But it's still something I'm, I'm wondering. Yeah. Well, um, we've talked about this on Facebook as well. We've engaged a little bit around this topic on Facebook. On the dating yeah. thing, I think that the answer is yes, he does. After thoughts upon slavery, make negative comments, or at least publishes negative comments. I made the point in my presentation that it's difficult to know whether Wesley is writing these things or his sources, the people he's borrowing from, um, which doesn't let him off the hook because if he was, you know, he, he does include this kind of language. So the last edition of the survey is 1777. So it's three years after the thoughts upon slavery. Oh. And in that edition does include the, these very um, um, white supremacist kind of negative comments. I'm quite convinced by David Field's argument that Wesley spoke either negatively or positively about the peoples of Africa, depending upon his polemical purpose at the time. So if he wanted to demonstrate how fallen the human being could become, you know, how sunk in depravity human beings can be, and he, and he means all human beings, he appeals to the Kohi Kohi people of the Cape of Good Hope, the so-called Hottentots, and he describes them in this almost sort of mythological fantasy type way, which he has derived from explorers' accounts and um, and popular literature and so on in a rather uncritical way, but he finds it useful for his purpose. But when he wants to talk about the uh, Africans of West Africa, um, those where the where the slavery industry was was focused and centered. He then wants to talk about them in a more positive way because he wants to attack the, the slavery as an industry. And it serves his purpose better to highlight the positive attributes, even of Muslim Africans, who he said were more moral than the average Christian, European Christian. <laughs> so I think David Field is onto something there that, that it's about polemical purposes and what kind of language best serves his purpose at the time. 
I would suggest that probably as a person, he had a deep love for the African people that he encountered and knew. He did meet a few slaves and ex-slaves, both in Georgia and in England. Um, and that he over, overall, he was the kind of person who wanted to appreciate and value and love the people he engaged with. At the same time, he's embedded in a culture that assumed European super superiority as most advanced and further along the scale of things. And, and he can't just be extricated from that, I don't think. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, on, on theology, uh, do we dismiss Wesley as theologian because of the presupposition that good theology is systematic theology, which is something that uh, as uh, as Pope, uh, Professor Pope mentioned earlier, uh, <clears throat> before Aquinas and you know John Calvin, theology was done uh, as uh, as uh, thinking about God, God's world, uh, God's world as something on the run. Uh, so if if we if we take that presupposition, was he not uh, rather a better model of theologian who think contextually, who think even uh, even if with the systematic approach to theology, we might find cons inconsistent to be. So that yeah, just... well, no, I don't think we should dismiss him as not a good theologian just because he didn't employ a certain theological method. So I hope nothing that I said su suggested that. It's only that we need to understand what kind of theologian he was. It's important to understand his method and his sources in his context uh, and not try to make him something that he was not. It's not the case that because he didn't do systematic theology, he wasn't therefore a good theologian. No, I wouldn't say that at all. Yeah. J Jane has been waiting a while. Yeah, Jane, yeah. Okay, thank you for your presentation. So uh, uh, some Christians, but as uh, conservative theologians generally believe that uh, salvation is uh, exclusively for human beings. Do you think uh, other creatures such as a cat or like an animal that besides human can be saved? If so, uh, what biblical evidence do you think support uh, the inclusion of other creatures in salvation? Well, Mick, I've been speaking for a while. Mick, do you, would you like to respond to that one? <laughs> yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah. I mean, well, where do you start? My, without proof texting, although I will obviously do that in a second, my understanding of the, the Hebrew mind is that it's it, you know, almost entirely this worldly, by which I mean to say it, there's, there's no degree of, unless you want to ascribe Paul as being you know how how much you want to describe Paul as a Hellenistic Jew. It's it's focused on physical reality and our existence in that, and therefore the renewal of that. So the shift from Old Testament eschatology to New Testament eschatology clearly involves a rounding off of history in a way that um, focuses on resurrection and transformation. But if you were to ask me what my proof text is, it's the entire of of scriptures that. Uh, the yeah, Hebrew religion is is all inclusive. So you look at the book of Leviticus and you go from how the temple functions and how people, how individual human beings who is or Israel society as a whole sway from God, how they're reconciled from God. And then the back half is all about what lay Israelite religion looks like. And that includes uh, good land care. It's giving Sabbath rest to, to the agricultural lands and allowing the wild creatures, quote unquote, to uh, benefit uh, from that as well and even dare I say although I've not the time to go back to my notes to justify this uh, a principle of animism involved in the holiness tradition but if you jump to the new testament it, it really screams to me salvation as creation renewed which is um, I've just nicked a book title haven't I uh, that you mentioned earlier Glenn um, from John's careful creation theology for example. So John 1 mirrors Genesis 1, John 20 mirrors Genesis 2, 
Jesus is the new Adam and John 21 is an appendix after John's past. And there are seven signs within John. And then the eighth sign is the, the resurrection or Colossians one, where all things are reconciled to God. Now that opens up the question of how the non-human creation, which cannot fall in the sense we might think, conceive of, of human beings as falling or making a, a, a volitional decision to move away from God's will talks about all things being reconciled. And, and I, I really do take that to mean both human institutions, which are the powers and the principalities and the authorities and whatever spiritual reality sits behind that, but also all things heaven and earth, going back to Genesis one again, meaning the whole shebang to Romans eight. Um, and Romans eight is the apex of Paul's account, as I alluded to earlier, of what's the problem of there being no few Jews in the first century church in Rome uh, and it just being made up of Gentiles and going through the whole story of Israel again to get to the point in narrative where Israel enters the promised land and it's those in Christ entering the new creation, which currently groans in birth planes, awaiting its own exodus, using explicitly exodus language to describe that, to um, the book of Revelation, where God, uh, where it's explicitly said that God is now in the present, and I'm reading it in a, a mostly preterist sense, making all things new through the reality of the church. But then all things, tarpanta, needs to mean all things. So the entire vision uh, of, of, of scripture is the story of creation to new creation and the inclusion of all things in God's great plan. Now, what does it mean for a, a gnat or a worm or a bacteria to be saved? I haven't the foggiest. All right. That's the sub part of one of the themes of my PhD coming up about how the suffering of each and every, every individual creature is redeemed. Mm -hmm. It's a good and open question. Perhaps the more pertinent question then is then how do we live uh, embody and share the gospel in a way in which affirms that all things are good in of themselves, all things are going to be, re be remade. And that's our responsibility as perhaps to borrow language from, I don't know, was it third century, fourth century, uh, human beings being the first among equals uh, to, to live in such a way that promotes the health and the well-being of the rest of the creation. So it's, it's not really a matter of, you know, which text do I point to? It's the, the entire of scripture. That's a short summary. Glenn, have you got any thoughts? Well, I would just add that it comes down to the question of does God love all that God has created or does God only love human beings? And whatever saving purposes flow out of, the, of divine love, um, they must include purposes for things, for beings other than human beings. Um, so I would say that, that God does love all that God has created and that the saving purposes that flow from that love must include thing, beings other than human beings. That's the way yeah. I would kind of logically lay it out, but I totally agree with all that Mika said as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, till uh, anyone... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have a question. Okay, go on, Mark. My, my apologies to Glenn because I missed the first 20 minutes. I got a good excuse because I was out of bush. And I, I very much practice engagement with the environment. Uh, so uh, in my volunteering time, I actually uh, uh, take overseas tourists through the Australian bush and trying to explain how it works and take them through usually the Blue Mountains, valleys and so on. Uh, my concern is that um, in our contemporary world, the connection between uh, the ecosystem and all its inhabitants, all the little creatures, and humankind has become severely disconnected. Now we all laugh at the joke that little children think that milk comes out of the big W, uh, the Woolworths truck. Uh, but that's just a consequence of <laughs> the way we live, and yet we are tied in because if mankind is to flourish backing out of where we are would destroy us. Now, we could destroy everyone and eventually come back to a Garden of Eden and build up again. My question, where to from here? I think where to from here, to me, it's, it's about if we accept the premise that God's purpose is to bring about a new creation, not just to destroy this earth and take us all to heaven, 
but there will be an eschatological end that all things will be reconciled, then the actions that we take in this present world must contribute to that final end. You know, that the kingdom of God, if you want, or the reign of God, however you want to describe it, or the new creation, um, you know, we, we, it's moving toward us and we're moving towards it, but it matters how we live in the present um, because we are a people of the end. We are an eschatological community. We're living out now what out of the vision of what will be in the world to come. So Paul has a similar argument in 1 Corinthians where he talks about, you know, would I take the members of my body and join them to a prostitute? And he says, no, God forbid, meganoito, because he's, he's making a connection between the physical body we have now and the resurrected body that we will have in the new creation. And his basic argument is you wouldn't do anything with your body now that you wouldn't do in the new creation. So behave now in the way that you, that you know will be the case in the world to come. So if we think about that in terms of the environment, if there will be in the new creation a harmony between, you know, the, bi the biosphere will be fully harmonized according to divine purpose and plan, then we must take action now to move toward that. And we must avoid any action now which runs contrary to that world that is to come. And that can mean everything from, you know, huge kind of global campaigns to. <laughs> Um, slow down the you know the impact and the speed of climate change all the way through to recycling or adopting a more plant-based diet or there's all sorts of things big and small that we can do but the I think the valuable thing for Christians is that we think about it in that theological way or we should and we think about it in terms of the new creation eschatology that is the expectation so where to now I guess it's toward the new creation and modeling out to the extent that we can, um, the values that will pertain, the reality that will pertain at that time. Yeah, it's a little agree, bit more complicated. Uh, Mick, sure. you go ahead. You go. No, no, no. I mean, I'm just going to add more text to the to the thing and and so on. Um, so Romans eight is kind of the church as being the beachhead of the new creation, um, and it's that kind of proleptic living. But I was going to add thinking about the book of Revelation, and and there's the very tricky aspect of of how we we think about political theology and how we engage politically. Um, clearly, John's writing to a church that doesn't live in a democracy that's persecuted by, in some way, shape or form, by the dominant order and, and is writing to say, no, God's in charge now and the source of blessing begins within the church itself. So it's uh, um, heaven has come to earth now in, in the reality and life of the church and you need to represent a new economic order. So the tensions that we face with the way in which we relate to the present economic system, and the present political system, is we really need to get a good shake because any amount of individual personal piety or, or whatnot or good theology won't do a lot unless we can draw together as a potent political force to challenge uh, the reality in which we live. You, there's no, there are, there are be as radical to say there's no solving the problem of climate change without smashing capitalism or that internal way of thinking that ex, um, infinite growth is both possible and desirable. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Mark, please keep going. <laughs> Maybe the uh, infinite growth is possible if we consider the future. But uh, look at economics. The difficulty is if you learn anything from history is that mankind's attempts to fix problems okay, ends up creating worse problems at the side. And that's something we are caught up in. This is an economic problem. You know, how, what choices do you make? For example, let me give you an example, uh, the barrier reef. Okay, we're all wor worried about the barrier reef. And suddenly the crown of thorns starfish come across and they oh, it devastates huge areas. So we started going around and collecting it. Now, if you do a bit of reading, we're actually now understanding uh, that these outbreaks aren't unnatural. They're quite natural. They come, they go up and down, up and down. And they actually have some sort of purpose. It seems to be uh, allowing the, cre creating a diversity. It allows uh, less uh, prolific corals from uh, growing. But the crown of stones, starfish wipes out other ones and then it's the other ones come forth. So collecting the crown of thorns, thorns starfish and destroying them all in an attempt to protect the reef 
actually has damaged the reef. That's not agreed with, but that's certainly a perspective. And same with a lot of climate change things. And we need to be very careful when we move into this space that we uh, we don't have a new arrogance, uh, just like uh, my predecessors did. In yeah, English. I think I think this is uh, this is uh, all, all good, and uh, uh, it's uh, useful to um, uh, always to return to to this line of thought. Uh, but I, I'd rather uh, uh, hark back to uh, uh, Glenn's presentation and uh, uh, mixed re response, uh, and uh, I would be interested uh, in um, getting a, a clearer idea as to whether uh, John Wesley had. Uh, a sense of well, let's call it, uh, I don't know, ecological uh, catholicity, where all things hold together. Because if I understood you correctly, Glenn, uh, on the one hand, uh, he described in the five volumes uh, species, species, species. So uh, somehow, uh, at, at least that's my impression, uh, not reading uh, those books, that he described them, uh, let's call them individually, uh, out of of their context. Uh, is, is there a sense in uh, in in uh, in these volumes that uh, he had a sense of things belonging together, and therefore uh, that kind of uh, let's call it, uh, how 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 was uh, what was it the, the the just community of nature might entail a kind of action, human action that takes in consideration this uh, belonging together of all things. I think there is. I think there is that connection to action in the lifestyle choices that he took on for himself and advocated to others. Because we didn't discuss this today, but as on as many people know, John Wesley was interested in medicine, interested in cures. One of his most widely read books is Primitive Physic, which went through numerous editions over, you know, it's still in print after three hundred years almost. Um, which offered a, a whole lot of home remedies to treat various ailments and illnesses on the assumption that what passed as medicine in the 18th century, um, that, that actually would do more harm than good and the people should take responsibility for their own health. So things like swearing off tea because of its deleterious effects or adopting a vegetarian diet, not that he didn't do so for the sorts of reasons that somebody might do today. It was partly his asceticism with his his sort of valorizing of the ascetic tradition, um, but also for health benefits, eating very simple foods, doing aerobic exercise. He had a lot to say about the value of walking and running and horse riding, um, how to sweat out fevers. And sure, a lot of it is quackery, like I'm sure rubbing onions on your head probably doesn't cure baldness, but the fact that he cared about that, that people were worried about losing their hair, so he offered a remedy, he offered a result. Uh, he offered a cure, a treatment. And then, of course, his fascination with the new science surrounding electricity and the curative properties of electricity. Um, so electrify, in his primitive physics, one of the frequently recurring um, little phrases is electrify daily. You know, like he'll give a series of, he'll give a series of health advisors and then at the end say electrify daily. And these were little electrification machines that you would wind up and it would create an electrical charge and, and it had like you were like grasping the horns of the altar you know you would gra grab onto the the poles and give yourself a little shock and of course we now know that electricity is used in a whole range of medical applications um you know whether it's just the the, the heat generated from electricity for people suffering from arthritis or you know the, the shock treatment that was once in vogue but is now thankfully starting to be per se, but to treat melancholia. And that's interesting because Wesley said the shock, ele applying electricity would treat melancholia or lowness of spirits, what we might call depression today. So these are all practical, hands on, because he's interested not only in science, but also technology. And he, he gives this sort of report on the state of the nation where he talks about the canals, the waterways, um, the um, the movement of goods from place to place all around Britain. And he takes on board some of the early economic theories of Adam Smith and people like that. He's fascinated by all of this stuff. So he's very practical, very grounded, very kind of grounded in experience and in the questions of the practical application of scientific and technological knowledge. 
but did he have this sense of things belonging together a kind of uh, uh I don't know awareness of uh, of an ecosystem where all things hold together. Um, my, I mean, uh, not reading the book for me, it's difficult to make sense of uh, uh, of this uh, and uh, uh, how I heard you uh, is that uh, in each volume he would describe a certain uh, species. Uh, question: Does he also uh, point out the fact that these things? Uh, belong together, uh, and there's uh, a, a balance within uh, uh, within nature, not only in regard to how God treats things, but also how uh, each being or, or the, uh, the, the different species hold together uh, in some kind of uh, balance and harmony. Yes, yeah, so it definitely it definitely is there. He, he shares in the mania of the age of classification, so he wants to classify everything as a way of understanding it. Um, but he also speaks about the just community of nature and also that everything, that there's, there's like a sum total of matter in the universe, which has been there since creation. And it neither increases nor decreases. As things die, um, living things benefit from that decay. Um, animals predate upon other animals. So the dead animal is giving life to the living animal. And nothing, he says, nothing exists of itself, that is, for itself. It always is connected to a web of interconnectivity. Now, I think the problem is that he understands this interconnected web as something divinely given, divinely preserved, in a sense controlled by God, and more or less guaranteed, as if nothing could ever be out of kilter. See, and that's I think where he where we can't accept his over you know his his outlook because now we understand that because primarily because of human activity things are very much out of kilter, and whatever divinely intended harmony might have once existed or might exist in the future, it doesn't exist that way now, and I don't think he takes that seriously because he's not aware he's not aware of he's only at the very cusp of the industrial revolution he only views the industrial revolution in its infancy as something very positive he doesn't understand that it's negative impact and cannot as we do in retrospect any other views uh with this um uh, sense of um ecological, whatever wholeness, uh, mean that uh, uh, his sources were the usual uh, Christian worldview, scriptural worldview, uh, perhaps with uh, some help from whatever natural sciences were emerging at the time? Uh, or is there any sense that uh, he was sensitive to uh, indigenous wisdom? Uh, you said uh, he he traveled a bit. Did he um, uh, come across, you know, uh, uh, stories uh, of uh, indigenous populations that he showed some appreciation for? Well, he was a missionary in in the colony of Georgia, ostensibly to evangelize the Native Americans. I think the they were Choctaw people in that part of the country. There may have been other tribal groups, but he had no success. And he, he got so caught up with the settlers and their pastoral needs that he really didn't, wasn't an effective missionary. But he does have in the early volumes of his journal, fascinating descriptions of conversations that he had, kind of a verbatim discussion uh, with Native American leaders about their concept of God and of the afterlife um, when you read it, though, it seems to be very much coloured by his assumptions. I think we have to take it a bit with a grain of salt. The way he describes their responses to his questions, they seem to be loaded towards the outcomes that he would be looking for, for especially for his reading public. You know, for example, he says, oh, do you believe there is one who lives in the sky? Oh, yes, we believe there is one and that, there are, that, that he is three. I'm like, okay. But to me, that sounds like, he wants people to think that Native Americans believe in the Trinity. <laughs> and maybe they did say something that, that made him draw that conclusion, but it just doesn't read authentically. 
So it doesn't really have much serious engagement with Indigenous populations or Indigenous cultures. And when he reads James Cook's journals of his specific voyages, he equates it with Robinson Crusoe. He says it's just a fantasy. He doesn't accept. He, he like Cook's descriptions of Pacific Islanders lying in lying in the sun naked or making love under the sun under a coconut tree, you know, a palm tree, uh, like without shame. And and Wesley says, no, this is just fantasy. This is just uh, a curious speculation invented for prurient readers, you know, and he, he, he literally equates it with Robinson Crusoe. So he doesn't take it seriously. He doesn't take he, his own assumptions about quote unquote savages seem to control every bit of information he receives about Indigenous peoples. And I don't think there's really an honest attempt to understand them on their own terms. And in this, of course, he's typical of 18th century English people. Yeah, well, that, that, that's the thing, because uh, uh, to my shame, only recently have I uh, uh, read uh, this one, highly recommended, um, The Dawn of Everything. Uh, and uh, uh, what the authors describe is... Uh, uh, much more sensitivity on, on the part of the French, in uh, especially in uh, Canada and um, the northern uh, parts of uh, uh, the nowadays uh, United States, uh, to uh, indigenous wisdom. Uh, and uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff that I didn't know of. Uh, uh, actually, these authors um, uh, challenged entirely my worldview, saying that. Uh, uh, these French uh, uh, colonists and especially missionaries uh, and travelers, some of they, uh, some of them, learned immensely from uh, uh, Native Americans uh, and uh, returned home to uh, to Europe uh, and infected. That's my word. Um, uh, the intelligentsia to the extent that they catalyzed what we today call the Enlightenment. So the, the, there isn't such a cultural sensitivity. Uh, in, in England, in, in Wesley's uh, uh, England, um, nothing uh, of the kind that uh, these authors describe about French, isn't it? Uh, the French uh, missionaries and travelers. Yes, well, well, there are always exceptions and there's always selectivity involved in any historical narrative is going to select um, those sources which support the overall thesis that's being, you know, built. Uh, built. Um, but I would think that uh, Sebagnon, Matthew... Um, would have some things to say about francophone attitudes towards Africans because he's from Benin, which is a French-speaking, which was a French-speaking colony, and um, he's very much aware of the way in which colon, even after independence, uh, colonization continued to have a controlling impact upon Benin and other formerly French colonies. I don't know, Matthew, whether you want to comment on that. Uh, our, our, actually, our time is uh, is uh, uh, is up. Okay, uh, it is. You're uh, right. We don't we don't have time for okay. uh, further comments. Uh, thank you very much. This has been fascinating, really. Um, uh, so new facets to uh, uh, the thinking and uh, the contributions of uh, of John Wesley. And thank you very much, both uh, Glenn and uh, and Mick and uh, uh, and um, the people who intervened. Uh, I wouldn't like us to say uh, uh, goodbye without uh, my uh, expressing uh, heartfelt gratitude uh, to Jackie Liu, uh, my uh, um, help uh, throughout this uh, uh, series of seminars. Uh, uh, she is uh, living East Coast. Uh, sadly, uh, she, she found uh, a, a different uh, career opportunity. Uh, and uh, uh, she'll be greatly missed. Uh, she helped me immensely with uh, with the seminars and many other discussed undertakings. Uh, and uh, I uh, thank you very much, uh, Jackie. We we all thank you for all your great work uh, assisting with uh, these uh, videos and producing them and uh, advertising and all that. Indeed. May you have a a great journey in career and life. Um, and uh, on this note, I uh, uh, close this um, uh, session, this seminar by uh, uh, the usual 
Sydney language uh, uh, farewell. Vijarigura Yana Janawi. Thank you for walking with me. Thank you for walking together. Uh, until next time, Godspeed. <laughs>